Hey, it's Matt Sager. And yet another story about toxic workplaces. These stories really speak to me for a number of reasons. The obvious one being that I'm a human who's got sympathy and who doesn't like despicable behavior being attached to the entertainment that I consume and enjoy and talk about on this podcast. It's also, I'll be honest, a bit of a revelation for me that, wow, you mean illegal and abusive behavior is something that people can now be called on the carpet for? That's, that's really great. And it comes with a little bit of bittersweetness for me, not because I don't feel it's deserved. I think it's completely deserved. But I had a long and storied career in the entertainment industry from MTV to multiple radio stations to the Grammy Awards to the Tony Awards to working with Jon Stewart. Out of maybe a hundred jobs in the span of a decade or so, I could name maybe two that weren't toxic, abusive. At Sirius XM, I lived under a pretty much constant cloud of sexual assault and harassment. And that was just the norm. The very top programmer there, while not sexually abusive, was physically abusive. That was just how things were. I'd talk to my agent, I'd talk to my lawyer, I'd send emails, I'd complain. No one cared. So I'm really glad that now the entertainment business is becoming a humane environment. It's long overdue. And I wish I'd made a louder noise on my own behalf. I wish those who represented me took a greater stand on my behalf. But it was everywhere. It's not like I was some weird, oh boy, look at Matt. Boy, that's a cautionary tale. It was just the norm. People abused power and they abused their underlings. They even abused the people who worked over them in order to sabotage them. The entertainment industry was a minefield of bloody, traitorous scum. And so this article today in The Hollywood Reporter is not a shock to me, but it saddens me. Because we've all heard a lot about Brian Singer's behavior on the set of among other movies, his many X-Men films. And in what begins as a sort of clickbaity article about Michael Jackson wanting to play Professor X and Brian Singer having to explain to him that, you know, Professor X is rather old, right? Michael's like, yeah. And kind of sort of European type. Yeah. And um, not to get weird, but he's a Caucasian man. Yep. I, I can do all that. And... um Two lunatics in a trailer together discussing stuff like that. One can only imagine how that conversation went. I actually met Michael Jackson one time. He was really nice, desperately shy, but super weird. I mean, just unbelievably weird, uncomfortable, just vibes everywhere from him. Brian Singer I've never met, but I've heard a lot of awful stories. And he's been accused on multiple occasions of sexual harassment, of dangling roles as payment for sexual services rendered. I've heard awful stuff about his behavior around minors, not just on the X-Men, but really upsetting stuff on the set of, for instance, Apt Pupil. But this X-Men article goes into rather great detail. I'll attach a link to it in the episode's description, but the title says an awful lot about it. The title is Brian Singer's Traumatic X-Men Set. The movie created a monster. So Singer was just 34 when he came aboard the X-Men franchise. Young, cocky, and he was able to convince Fox. Keep in mind, this was well before there was an idea for a Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was during a time when the idea of comic-based movies was frowned upon. It was considered silly. Superhero movies were basically dead at this point. And Brian Singer, through sheer force of will charisma, pushiness, and attitude brought them back by way of the X-Men. Yes, Blade had been an outlier as well. A lot of stuff was happening at once. Sony was beginning to finalize plans for Spider-Man, but they weren't in place yet. X-Men was a big deal. But as this article points out, subsequent to becoming the big shot of the X-Men on the Fox lot, Singer is now inundated with accusations, lawsuits, keeping in mind that Glad was very excited about the X-Men because they felt that Singer was using mutants as an allegory for the homosexual experience. And now they're aware that he stands accused of molestation, harassment, all the way up to rape. So Glad's Matthew Lasky says, quote, It's critical when analyzing Brian Singer's body of work that we center the experiences and trauma faced by his victims and put their continued well-being first. GLAD stands for the protection of LGBTQ people, 
especially LGBTQ youth. And those who would wish to do them harm are no friend to the LGBTQ community. This story gets pretty crazy, and it touches on, among other things, drug use, of course. Singer evidently was on painkillers. For what purpose? It's not clear. Were they opioids? Based on the story, based on the behavior they seemed to provoke in him? Probably. The very first X-Men movie, it was greenlit in summer of 98, given a $75 million budget, and the writing process was a mess, notwithstanding the now also apparently, allegedly toxic Joss Whedon at one point coming in to do a rewrite, something he's referenced a lot in interviews, even referenced in jokes in later seasons of Buffy and Angel. Hollywood Reporter says, quote, several sources say the story meetings were unprofessional, even by eccentric auteur standards. A source says, quote, Brian would bring people to story meetings who weren't involved in the movies. Young guys, a different person every time. Here's where it gets crazy. Despite a lineup of A-list writers, David Hayter, who had served as singer's assistant answering phones in the production offices for $500 a week, received sole writer's credit. Hayter had recently produced and starred in the slam dance feature Burn, and he was a big X-Men fan. So Singer began to rely on Hayter for his comic knowledge and eventually had him writing new scenes. Somehow this came to him being the sole credited writer on X-Men, burning many writers. Writing credits on films are often contested, rarely to this degree. The article goes on to discuss casting, what an odd mix it ended up being, and it really was. A mix of Shakespearean-trained Brits, that would be Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen, a supermodel, Rebecca Romaine, a pro wrestler, Tyler Maine, and Halle Berry. This is starting to sound a little bit like the Gilligan's Island theme song. The supermodel, the wrestler too. But the article goes on to say that Hugh Jackman was brought in at the time in Unknown, and as we of course now know, he became a force to be reckoned with thanks to his starring role as Wolverine. The article goes on to say many of the smaller and extra roles were peppered with handsome young men. Nothing wrong with that on its face. I come to this article with a history of having been sexually harassed by gay men in authority. And it's not fun. The fact that I'm heterosexual is, I believe, largely irrelevant here. Harassment is harassment. Unwanted, touching, groping, threats, quid pro quo offers. Like, if you do this, you get to stay in the movie. That is all wildly illegal and unacceptable. The article says a number of young men, including some who were minors at the time, have claimed in published interviews that Singer dangled X-Men auditions and roles in exchange for sex. In hindsight, it says, some project insiders say one piece of casting should have prompted a red flag, at least subsequently. That of Alex Burton, an 18-year-old who played the bit part of Pyro. Nobody remembers how Burton, who had no previous credits, was cast. One source says Burton told him, Mark... That would be Mark Collins Rector, and Brian Singer created that role for me. Another source says that Burton was flown up to the Toronto set from L.A. in unheard of move, given the size of his role. Studios typically cast locals for talent with one or no lines. Eight days after X-Men's Ellis Island premiere on July 12, 2000, Burton filed a civil suit against three of Singer's friends and business associates in the digital entertainment network venture. This a youth-skewing multimedia.com and precursor to YouTube. Burton claimed that he had been plied with drugs, sexually assaulted by the three men who ran the Digital Entertainment Network, held against his will, and threatened with physical harm between July 1999 and May of 2000. These men were all Singer's friends and business associates, yet Singer himself was strangely not named in the suit. The suit does say that Mark Collins Rector of DEN, quote, threatened to use his power and influence in the entertainment industry to prevent Burton from gaining employment in the field of entertainment. And to the best of my knowledge, that has proven to be the case, that Burton has not pursued a career or had any success with a career in the entertainment industry since. Haven't seen him in any roles, haven't heard about him doing much of anything. His attorney, Daniel Charon, has said, quote, Why have we accepted that the exploitation of women is outrageous and fair game to confront, but are not willing to when it's gay men exploiting young men or boys? 
the ability to exploit is exactly the same. Who is more manipulatable than a teenager? This is where the article starts talking about the fact that Singer admitted that at the time he was taking pain meds. People on the set described his drug use as problematic, causing stuff like late arrivals, mood swings, and tantrums. Actors like Rebecca Romaine needed hours and hours in the makeup chair to be ready to play Mystique in a scene. And Singer, on a whim, would decide to not use her in a scene. A young Kevin Feige, at the time, just a guy working for Lauren Schuler Donner, a major Fox producer, was charged with ensuring that someone was keeping Singer from going completely off the deep end and acting like a complete lunatic. It's awful when a production needs somebody in that role. But that's where we first meet Kevin Feige in the Marvel Universe, as a guy trying to keep Brian Singer from losing all control, being a drug-addled maniac, halting production according to his own moods. That said, everybody was so happy with the way X-Men earned $54 million its first weekend, ended up netting $296 million worldwide. Critics loved it. Studio was all on board with bringing Singer back for an X-Men sequel, X2. And here it gets worse. Singer is given a bigger budget for X2, $50 million more than he had for the first X-Men movie. And people started wondering about the kind of company he was keeping. So it's here where Singer starts associating on set with a Broadway producer named Gary Goddard. He, too, was an investor in this DEN, Digital Entertainment Network, and he, too, was subsequently accused of sexual assault by multiple men when they were minors, among them Anthony Edwards from ER. Goddard denied everything. Everyone here denies everything. People deny everything. I'm not saying that means they're guilty, but... It's very rare that a guilty person will stand up and go, oh yeah, nope, that was me, sorry. That's not how predators function. But here's where it goes off the rails, and I no longer understand why he was brought back for subsequent movies after X2. Singer's behavior grows erratic and destructive, and producer Tom DeSanto gets into a fight with him, tries to shut down shooting because he finds out that, yet again, Singer is out of it because he's taking narcotics. Not only that, other crew members had been taking the same narcotic. DeSanto is afraid that someone's going to get hurt on set. Everybody but McKellen is in this scene with a major stunt. But Singer insists, I'm not incapacitated. I'm functioning perfectly fine. Everything's safe. Nothing's going to happen. We're going to keep shooting. We're going to do the stunt. And oh, look at this. Hugh Jackman finds himself bleeding on camera because the stunt gets botched. Another X-Men producer steps in and halts production for the day. But the next day, Fox is once again standing by Brian Singer's side. They order Tom DeSanto to return to L.A., leave him alone. And this is where a scene I would love to get footage of occurs. Not an actual X-Men movie scene, but something fit for a movie documentary. This sounds just bizarre. The main cast members... Every major X-Men cast member, with the exceptions of Ian McKellen and Rebecca Romaine, they're all dressed up in their full X-Men gear, and they launch an intervention. They descend on Singer in his trailer. They confront him, and they say that if DeSanto leaves, they're going to quit. And allegedly, Halle Berry, again dressed as Storm, says to Brian Singer, you can kiss my black ass. This is apparently a story an anecdote that's been repeated many times throughout the years. A rep for Singer has, of course, said, Nothing like that ever happened. But essentially, they were saying, Look, if you don't restore some sense of safety and normalcy to this set, we're going to walk. So as we're evaluating the legacy of the X-Men movies, after 20 years of them, featuring wildly varying degrees of quality, everything from X-Men to Days of Future Past, eh, First Class, one of the best movies, and of course, Bowing Out with Logan, which was a legitimate classic. Not even a comic book classic, a genuine classic film. But it's got a mixed legacy, and included in that legacy is the ongoing toxic presence. The man that launched the franchise for all practical purposes, Brian Singer. So at this time when toxic employers, nasty, harassing, abusive employers including Ellen DeGeneres, are coming under fire. It should matter to all of us. It certainly matters to me, and that might just be because of my experience with toxic and abusive coworkers and employers. But one sad 
part of the X-Men movie's legacy will be that of Brian Singer. It shouldn't impact in any way your enjoyment of the X-Men films, but it should impact Brian Singer's ability to work going forward if he is legitimately, as appears to be the case, based on many allegations, anecdotal evidence, circumstantial. Basically, he needs to be investigated. Not because of a witch hunt, but because if this stuff is true, he should be kept away from people. He shouldn't be in positions of power. And if it's not true, his reputation should be left unscathed. Either way, something needs to happen. This whole, well, he probably did something awful, but we haven't proven it, so he's just going to keep on working with kids. That's not acceptable. Nor is it the case that if he's some innocent guy, it's okay for his image to be tarnished this way. It is time for the light to be shown on Brian Singer. That's my thesis. It's my takeaway from all this. And as for the X-Men movies, like you, I'm sure, I enjoyed quite a few of them. Some of them were genuinely embarrassing and angering. Like I wanted my, not just money back, but that 90 minute to two hours of my life back, X-Men Origins Wolverine. In any event, as the world continues to evolve, which really, in addition to race, the gay experience, any number of things for which the mutants are a stand-in for, they are ultimately in the macro about evolution for the better. And so as we evolve, it's great that light is being shown on toxic people and toxic workplaces, and that going forward, let us hope that they will no longer be accepted. That's my wish for me and for all of you. I also hope that you're subscribed to this podcast. If you're on YouTube, just hit subscribe, ding the bell for notifications, like and share. You can also subscribe on any podcast app, and leave me reviews. If you'd like to support this podcast, just check out the links in this episode's description. There are also links there to all my social media profiles, my new subreddit. Please check those out. Thanks a lot, and I'll talk with you soon.